So our next speaker is General Alexander. Uh, the man needs no introduction, but I once heard somebody say, don't need introduction, and didn't introduce him, and he got in big trouble. <laughs> I'm not going to get in big trouble. He is General Alexander. So General Keith Alexander, CEO and President of IronNet Cybersecurity. He is. Uh, he provides a strategic vision to corporate leaders on cybersecurity issues through development of cutting-edge technology, consulting, and education. He has served as a first commander of U.S. Cyber Command from 2010 to 2014 and is the 16th director of the National Security Agency, chief of Central Security Services from 2005 to 2014. As commander of U.S. Cybercom, he was responsible for planning, coordinating, conducting operations, and defending the Department of Defense computer networks as well as the defense of the nation from cyber attacks. All right. So a couple of things you need to know about General Alexander. Number one, he was instrumental in creating the Army Cyber Institute. He said, we need some future-leaning organization that's going to look at the problem after next. And who best to do that? We'll have to figure that out. And we got tasked. It wasn't us because we didn't exist. So we created something new. And now there's this institute at West Point that is uh, responsible for many things. This event is just one of them. So, sir, thank you for that. But that's not enough. Now the joke, or now the, now the punchline. So in his role that we just talked about, the different uh, senior positions he had in government, he often hosted dignitaries at his home senior people from around the world. And how do you, what, what's the icebreaker you use for that? So here's what I found out. When someone new would come to his house, he had an apparatus in his pocket. What kind of apparatus would someone like the NSA director have in his pocket? He had a fart machine. And he would come up, shake hands, and he would squeeze it, and the noise would come out, and everyone looked mortified, and it was him playing a, playing a joke, lighting up the mood, to the point where he would bring some people to tears. Uh, it was so funny, while well, everyone else is, is mortified. But the, that side of him, I guarantee most of you probably have never seen or experienced. So I'm going to use that next time, sir. Thanks. You know, I hate long introductions. Uh, do you have my briefing? No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, for that story, I, uh, I'm learning something from the uh, debates uh, and from some of the Saturday Night Live stuff that when you do something like that, you probably should say you're sorry or apologize. <laughs> so I apologize. <laughs> what do you mean? I, I'm sorry. You know, yeah. You know, it is kind of interesting looking at all that's going on in this area. And it is important to keep a sense of humor, especially uh, for those that work so hard uh, to defend our nation. And I'll tell you what a privilege and honor it was to work uh, with the men and women in the intelligence community in our military for almost 40 years. In fact, my father-in-law used to say, um, why don't you get a real job? Uh, all the time. You're on the public dole. Get out and do something. Um, it was wonderful. Uh, those of you, and I, I noticed there were some of my classmates here from West Point, uh, 20, what year, 2017, 2018, 2019? Yeah, my classmates over there, <laughs> <laughs> or so I wish. Uh, a great future. What I'm going to talk about, since this is a, the uh, SICON, and I found out this was the inaugural, is that right? I wish I'd been here for the first one, but that's good. Um, I, I'll slow down on the jokes for some of you. And <laughs> remember, it's the only thing that keeps us going around here. I'm going to talk about a few things, uh, and some of them very serious. And that is uh, what's going to happen in cyberspace, you know, in terms of warfare. I want to talk a little bit about technology. I'm going to talk about some of the events that have gone on and what I think is a danger to our nation and to our allies in cyberspace. 
You know, it's interesting. I have 16 grandchildren. Yes, I know I look way too young for 16 grandchildren. They're all adopted. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. They're, they're real. And, you know, it's interesting. They come to our house, and you find out how old you are and how... I used to be really good at playing Mario with my daughters. I was really good. I was one of the top players. So with my grandsons, who are eight, they'll come racing in the house, jump on the couch, and say, come on, let's play Mario. You get in there, and you're too bad. They tell you to bubble up. And I go, what's bubble up? And they said, press this button. And then all of a sudden, you're in a bubble, and you just tag along because you're not good enough to stay with them. <laughs> and it's at that point that you find out that hitting them could be wrong. And your daughters would be mad. But you look at these. They're only eight years old. They're the future. Think about what they're doing on the network today. They all have iPads, iPhones. I know this because my wife bought them. You know, we're, we're bailing out many of the companies in this room here. Um, they're digital natives. They have Fitbits. How many here have Fitbits on? Look at that. Oh, you can raise your hand just because you don't have enough steps. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> they get into these competitions. You have your iPhones. You have all these things going on. We're becoming a digitized network. The mesh is coming in. The amount of new information on the network doubling every year. That's amazing. The new devices and technology doubling every two years. And the top 10 in-demand jobs didn't exist or were barely visible 10 years ago. Think of it. The iPhone came out in 2007. And Senator Warner talked about all the apps and stuff that are coming into it. That means we're training some of these kids that are going into college for jobs that don't exist using technology that hasn't been created to solve problems we don't even know are problems. That's how fast it's going. And you know, I'm on this presidential commission and I thought, well, they really want my technical expertise. And they said, no, no, we want your humor. We got all the tech guys we need. Uh, it, it's amazing. But one of the things that you learn in talking with the communities around the nation is uh, what Dave had on convergence. I'm going to take it one step further. If you think about convergence, we used to think about, could we create two internets, a secure world and an unsecure world? Could we do this? And you know, all this technology, all the devices that are out there, we just leave those over in the unsecure world and then we have the secure world. And then a few weeks ago, we saw Brian Krebs get hit with the largest distributed denial of service attack, over 620 gigabits per second. Akamai threw him off their website. Now he was there uh, free gratis, but they took him off. That came from cameras and other things that were around the world that other world. And what you're seeing is these two worlds are converging. And as they converge, we now have to have a system of systems that can defend it. You can't be on the network, but not part of the network. And this concept is going to be huge when we talk about the future of warfare. I've heard a lot of people say, we don't want to militarize the internet. And I agree with that concept. But this isn't something that we alone can vote on. In fact, that's gone now at least nine years ago with Estonia. Um, so let me just talk a little bit about the threat. I want to talk on two sets of the threats, and then I want to talk about what that means. Uh, we talked about Estonia, the distributed denial of service attack, in 2007, that was probably from Russia. 2008, Ukraine, or Georgia, uh, timed uniquely with a physical attack. 2008, the beginning of Cyber Command. Uh, we detected malicious software on our classified network. NSA was instrumental in helping to solve that problem. Secretary Gates saw that, and what he did you know, you find out no good deed goes unpunished. What he did is he said, you've been in charge of the offense. Now you have the defense. Um, and that bag was put on, uh, fertilizer was put. <laughs> and what you found out is, wow, 
trying to defend this network is impossible. The way it's brought together, what Senator Warner was talking about in patches and stuff, and just how big it's grown, the number of devices, 7 million plus, the way it's spread out, the way people connect to it, it's indefensible the way we had it. So I'm going to put that there and say, okay, so that's a problem. And uh, Senator Warner also pointed out, oh, by the way, that represents the best in government. So we're looking to say, whoa, okay, um, big problem. 2012, they mentioned the distributed denial of service attacks, but that was preceded by an attack on Saudi Aramco with both a distributed denial of service and a destructive attack uh, destroying the data on over 30,000 systems. Wiped them out. A week later, a similar attack hit Rasgas. Both were later credited in news by Iran, and then over 350 distributed denial of service attacks on Wall Street, the financial sector. One of the great concerns is what happens if they put those two together against Wall Street. Then you had a series of attacks that they talked about all the way up to the exploit on Yahoo, the uh, Ukrainian power grid, OPM. In fact, to get you quickly to a point, let me get this right, two sets of people, those that have been attacked and know it, and those that have been attacked and don't know it. What that tells me is the way we're going after it is, it's screwed up. Our strategy is broke. Now let me add some, some key things. I'm not a historian, I'm a technical person, so you guys that are more, know more about history can kind of help me out here. But if you think there's this guy named Clausewitz, I learned yesterday that he died. Um, he was back in the 1800s. He wrote a book called On War. On War, Total War. And when he talked about war, he gave some insights of what was to come, the way nations would fight. And they would use all the elements of national power to defeat an adversary. All the elements of national power. 30 some years later, there was discussion in England about the fact that there will never be a war again because commerce and industry is spread internationally. And we have no reason to fight amongst nations. And if they do fight, it'll only last a couple days, 1900. That led to World War I and World War II. So what do you learn from that? Don't make those predictions. No, I'm just kidding. What you learn is that, wow, that changed everything. And oh, by the way, what happened? We had aircraft come in. And people said, what are aircraft gonna be good for? Reconnaissance, they'll never be good for warfare because there's not things we can use in warfare. There's this. Followed several years later by the aircraft carrier. What was the aircraft carrier good for? Well, we can use that for reconnaissance. We can't think of any reason to use that in warfare. And look at what happened. They were all used in warfare. And now we look at the internet and we think about how important it is to us as a nation, to our allies, to the world. We're all connected. And it's where our intellectual property our government, the way we vote, our wealth, our children's data, our grandchildren's data, all of us now are in that environment. And here's the fact. It will be used against us in warfare, period. We can say we don't want it, we can make up all the rules, but those who wish us harm, or our allies, will use this as a form of warfare. You saw what happened to Sony. I wanna just segue into a couple things and then we'll talk about how we take this on. So who's gonna fight back? Do we have industry do that? And I am convinced that we should not, cannot have industry attack back. And let me give you a few reasons why. If you think about Sony, and we give them some advanced tools, and they see North Korea coming at them, case number one, and they launch an attack back, take out the six computers in North Korea, all of them, and uh, it's devastating, 
And uh, I apologize. Uh, I did like that word, you know, I didn't know how to pronounce that. Um, when you think about what they could do and what it could mean to a war on the Korean Peninsula, that if North Korea was attacked, misread that, and they start lobbing artillery into South Korea, Sony under that case would have started a war that we did not want started. The second case is, let's say that the attack came through servers in China. And so Sony, believing it's China that's attacking them, attacked the servers in China. This is like one of those bar fights, right? Where you go into a bar, you're sitting out there in the bar and somebody turns around and hits you. And they say, oh, I thought you were with him. I don't know this guy. All of a sudden you're in a bar fight. That's what I used to tell my parents. I had nothing to do with it. I was just, uh, then they found out well, the drinking age was a little bit high. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you gotta have a sense of humor. So we attacked the wrong network. We started a different crisis. In both cases, those are inherent government responsibilities. That's what our nation's leadership has been there, Congress and the administration. They're the ones that determine if we go to war. They're the ones that determine how to respond. And I think what Senator Warner said about look at all the different options, that's what we give the President and the Secretary of Defense. So why do I bring this up? Because somebody made that the topic of my speech. No, I'm just kidding. Um, because I think this is the biggest issue that we face today. And to add to it, it's interesting. I started out with, think about the great people that we get to work with in the military and the intelligence community. Now look at what's going on around the world today. It starts with, let's just talk about Russia. And we talked about Estonia, and we talked about Georgia, and you can think about Ukraine. Now you have Russia putting missiles on the border of NATO, putting in deception, raising troops up there on, Eastern Ukraine, on the border of East Ukraine. You've got deals with Turkey and Syria going on, nuclear plants going into the Middle East, and a huge opportunity for miscalculation. In fact, the question is, what is the motive for Russia on Eastern Ukraine, and when will they act? I believe we're going to be challenged in that space over the next few months. And when they do that, if they want to push back on the United States, two ways you can do it. Terrorism and cyber. And we're not ready for the cyber portion of that. Then look at China, who, you know, it's interesting, uh, last year, President Obama and President Xi Jinping met, and they talked about uh, China stopping some of the exploits and attacks into the United States. And you saw in the press recently that that, in fact, has dropped down. And you think, we're on the right glide path. And then you look at what's going on in the South China Sea, and you see the tension that's playing there. Two Chinese aircraft flew dangerously close to a US aircraft. And then to add to that, China said they're gonna go into Syria on the side of Russia. And that begins to destabilize a region, in my opinion. We're not fixing the Middle East, we're hurting it. Uh, let me just take a minute on the Middle East because all of this will come back to, so what are we gonna do in cyber? I believe we need a, a Marshall Plan for the Middle East. When you think about Egypt and what's going on there, 80 plus million people, 25% out of jobs, they have very little choice as they're growing up. Jihad or job, there's no power, there's no job opportunity. If Egypt collapse, the immigration into Europe will be devastating. What about Jordan? What about Syria? What about Saudi Arabia? The Middle East, we cannot afford that to happen. 
And so this is a, the center of three continents, and it's a huge problem, and we've got to help out, and we're not doing that. So some of the things that, that comes to my mind on, so what are we going to do about all this, and what do we think is going to happen? I do believe that we're going to be challenged in these areas. We have not fully got our, our heads around what it means for network convergence with this Internet of Things. As Senator Warner said, we don't have the legislation. We stood up Cyber Command and the subordinate commands with a ability, and Secretary Gates was phenomenal to work with, with the understanding that we're going to be challenged in this space. I think that was a great measure. Here's the problem. It, it was interesting. Um, you, again, you got to have a sense of humor. And so uh, I went into the Pentagon and talked to several of the senior ranking civilians about the mission statement for Cyber Command, for my new command. And I said, I think our job is to defend. They said, well, your first job is to defend DOD, DOD networks. And I thought, well, I, th I thought our job was to defend that. No, General, your job is to do this, this, and this. So the nice part is, you know, I was already extended beyond my normal lifetime for a general. So I thought, well, I knew Panetta really well. He has a great sense of humor. So I walked up to him and said, Mr. Secretary, I got a question for you. If we got missiles going into Denver and we see them, and we see these missiles coming in, and we track them, and we say, whoa, they're going to hit a civilian area, let them go, not going to bother the military. We okay with that? We said, no, no, we're going to stop all missiles. I said, so we see this cyber attack coming into the financial sector in New York, it's going to wipe them out. We all realize, military, we don't have any money, let it go. <laughs> I said, imagine the next day, you and I, sitting in front of Congress, explaining that one. <laughs> You're going to be the first witness. I'm going to just say, I did what he told me to do. I watched it. It was bad. <laughs> they got them good. No money left there. And he said, I'm with you. And he actually said, the Defense Department's mission is to defend the nation. That's our job. It's the government's for the people, by the people. And so if you, if you agree with that, so now you have another problem. Why didn't we stop Sony from getting whacked? It's not a government for some of the people, all you guys in critical infrastructure, you're lucky, you're going to be good. All the rest of you, sorry. Um, can't do that. It's not a government for some of the people some of the time. It's to protect our nation. And in fact, if you take this issue of convergence and you play it out, what's it do? It's all connected. So let's say that this is the unprotected, not critical infrastructure, and over here from Estonia and the rest of it is the critical infrastructure, and then this becomes the attack surface for this. Whoops, sorry. That's not going to work. That will not work. So that makes you need more people, Paul. We're going to have to get you 10 more, maybe, to take on the rest of this. So how do you do that? What do we do? This is where information sharing becomes critical. And I'm not talking about information sharing by passing notes. I'm talking about information sharing that goes something like this. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you got to be quick here. Information sharing like radars. Think about this. We have radars that go around the world that track aircraft, right? And why? Well, you're up there at 35,000 feet on United Flight 860. You're very happy that they're tracking and ensuring there's not another aircraft that's going to hit you, right? And you don't have one radar operator down there saying, I'm tracking Flight 860. I'll send an email to my buddy over there saying, 860 is on this path. He gets the email 10 minutes later. He looks it up and he goes, which one is that? It's seamless. It's integrated. It operates at network speed. Yet, industry and government act as single points. So think about this. Whether it's OPM, DOD, 
any government agency or civilian. They are, they are defending themselves, and then we share at these speeds. You know, one of the things that I learned in talking to the financial sector when I first got out, 7,000 banks. I thought, wow, Willie Sutton would be thinking, they, look at this, 7,000 banks to rob. And uh, uh, can you strike that last part there? I just say, so 7,000 banks. And some of those, like Citi and J.P. Morgan, they have really world-class cyber teams. But you're small and mid-sized, they don't, they can't afford it. Imagine if we had 7,000 banks all working together, sharing information at network speed about things coming after them. How much better it would be? It would be three orders of magnitude better than what one bank could do, statistically. So how do we do that? I don't know. That ends my seat now. So, so let me give you some thoughts about what we need to do to get there. If you buy that first uh, assumption that we're better off by sharing at network speed, and we can now take that picture that Dave had of Raytheon, of the thing flying over, and instead you say, here's the financial sector on one layer, the energy sector, and each of the sectors, and think about those sharing information at network speed, and if they're attacked in these areas, whether it's law enforcement or nation state, it could be shared with the appropriate people in government and still protect civil liberties and privacy. I'll come back and hit civil liberties and privacy in a minute. But imagine if we could share that, then when somebody like Sony is being attacked, appropriate people in government could see what response and how to stop it. Set up the rules of engagement, get Congress to buy in, tell the American people, work with our allies, but set up a way of stopping it. Because right now, if you, if you go to Sony, Here's the way we actually do it. It's called incident response. Think of it as if you're on an aircraft, they have the National Transportation and Safety Board come in to investigate plane crashes, right? That's the incident response team. Now, as a person who flies a lot, I want the benefit of learning how not to crash rather than having the NTSB come in and say, oh, this was bad. You know, because that's what we did for Sony. We came in after the fact, and we said to them, you've been hacked. We know that. It's really bad. We know that. You lost all your data. We know that, too. Probably going to lose your job. We know that, too. <laughs> said, well, we're the government. We're here to help. <laughs> Anything else you need? And what Sony really wants is, could we have stopped that? And the answer is technically we could, but we don't share at that speed. And the government cannot see, despite what, whatever you hear about, the government cannot see all these things going on in cyberspace. So we need a fabric, a framework, a reflective surface that can share that information, the appropriate information, and allow the government to do what you, what commercial industry wants them to do, and what they need to do to defend the country. Let's take it another kind of path. If you were a bad guy, I'm a good guy, but if you were a bad guy and you were looking at our country, would you say, I'm, to really get you guys good, to get the United States, I'm going to go after uh, Bank X? That's one off. You know, everybody's, well, that's not going to have the effect. If you want to have effects, they're going to come after sectors, the energy sector, they're going to try to do a lot of damage. If you want to send a big message, they're going to send something like that and say, whoa, those, if those hackers, we'll go look for those hackers. What did it look like? We'll go find out who did it, and we'll stop. We'll hold them accountable. That's bad. But the practical reality, we know, in most cases, that's going to have nation state backing. And we're not ready. So we have to get those rules, that training, and that capability. And I think technically that exists. We just have to go do it. And that's where Congress can come in. Of course, as soon as you do that, one of the things 
that comes up is, well, what about our civil liberties and privacy? And that was further brought to light on the Snowden stuff, a name who should not be spoken. There's a whole bunch of things I could say, but I know this is being filmed. There's a lot of people tweeting. So, you know, RB is probably his nickname. Um, I will get to that later. And uh, here's, the, here's the real issue. Um, two months after the Snowden event happened, I get, I get invited down to the White House. And, you know, as interesting as the NSA director, I didn't realize how often I would go down to the White House. Uh, it, was, it was amazing. It, it really was neat. You got to see all these things. This day was not quite as neat as some of the others. And uh, you got to take it where it comes. And so they're sitting across the table and they say, uh, and I knew that they wanted to have a presidential review group. And I thought, well, this is great. We can get the American people to know exactly what we did, why we're doing it, how we're doing it. We can get people like Condoleezza Rice. We can get Colin Powell. They can be luminaries. They can tell the American people. So I come in with these ideas. I sit down. They said, we're going to have a presidential review group. And I go, I know. And I've got some great names for you. And they go, we've already made a decision. I said, but I have some great ideas. They said, we've already made a decision. The president has decided. And they slide this across the table. And you think, ooh, it's not good when they use their fingertips to slide them across. <laughs> they do not want you to grab their hand so they can pull it back quick. And so I grabbed this. I'm going to tell you what I said. I'm not proud of it. And so I read the first thing there, and it's yada, 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 board member of the ACLU. And I said, you've got to be shitting me. This guy's suing us, and you want him to be on the board? So the president has decided. Okay, I'm a good soldier. I will do it. What do you want? said. So the next day, uh, the, the team comes up to NSA. Two story. And he's sitting about where you are. His arms are like this. He's looking at me like, Luke, I ate your father. <laughs> and, and I looked at him somewhat askance. And I thought, well, you know, I'm, we're actually doing what the nation has asked us to do. So I walk him through the two programs. And then I said, but even better, we'll have some of the seniors talk today. But more importantly, we'll have the young people of NSA who run these programs over the next five weeks. Every time you come up here, they will walk through everything they've done with that program, 100% audit, and show you everything. Complete transparency. And they did. Five weeks later, uh, they're finishing up. So I come back in the room. And the guy gets up as, I, as soon as I come in the room. And I forgot my protection unit's not with me. But I thought, well. He jumps up and he comes walking around the table pretty quick. And I thought, okay, I'm in pretty good shape. I think I can take him. I, this is, you know, I'm ready. And he comes up and he grabs my hand. And you know those people that shake hands like this and you're going like this? You're going like that? Yeah, that's how he did it. And he said to me, he goes, you and your people have the greatest integrity of any government agency I've seen. I was stunned. I was like, who are you and what did you do with the ACLU, dude? Um, and I said, well, OK, OK, tell the president, tell Congress, tell the American people, and tell the people of NSA. And he said, I'll do that. So I'm going to read you something that he said, because this is important on the facts. Every one of the programs the NSA was running in foreign intelligence surveillance, oh, that's one, not the one I want to read. I guess that's the one I'm going to read. Here's what he said. He said to the fact that I looked at all these programs. I found what NSA was doing was right, was legal, they were stopping terrorist attacks, and they had great integrity, and they followed the rule of law. Jeffrey Stone, acting dean at the University of Chicago Law School, and a board member of the ACLU, and a presidential review group man. So as it turns out, the idea that the president had to put a guy like that on this panel was absolutely right. It was a great decision. Why? If Jeffrey Stone can come to NSA and look at the most controversial program and say, well, I don't agree with this program per se, I'll actually write an op-ed with this Army guy so we get it renewed under a right thing because it's good for our country. An ACLU guy and an Army guy actually did an op-ed several months later to get that program reauthorized. And the reason we did it was not because they're collecting data on American citizens. It's because it's needed 
to protect our country in cyberspace. So here's the other part. I actually give a little bit longer version when I talk to folks on this. I said, so how many people knew that Jeff Stone has made these comments? Nobody. I said, because what you get in the press is sensationalized and inflamed. It's not all the facts. If in the facts you knew that the program and the way NSA actually wrote those and did those, what you'd find out is it does more to protect our civil liberties and privacy than anything else we have. But that didn't come through. I bring that up because as we go into cyberspace, that is going to be one of the most important issues. And we have to have the facts out there. You have to help get the facts out there. We have to have the American people who are making these decisions understand the facts and make that based on the fact. I'm going to give you another one uh, to wrap this up, uh, a couple stories here. <clears throat> We've got to get civil liberties and privacy. We can do both, and security. I think there's a couple other things that we need to think about as we go forward. This, this area here, and I'm not a political person, I'm not going to jump into the political realm, but I want to talk about leadership. And I'm going to give you a story. I served four years with President Bush and four years and eight months with President Obama, and what I found out, they're good people trying to do the right thing for our country. Leadership. I'm going to give you a great story on it, because... Uh, you know, there's some opportunity for leading people up, uh, up there at NSA and Cyber Command. You get to see some of the best leaders in the world, and it's amazing. And uh, about a year into my uh, leadership position up there, President Bush is coming to NSA. And now we have this big parade field out in front of our quarters, and so my wife can see him getting off at the of course, the Secret Service says you have to stand back from windows, ma'am. But you see the people out there. And so the president gets off his helicopter, and I salute him, welcome to Fort Meade, Mr. President. He says, General, get in the car. we got to talk. Just like that. Um, and, oh, by the way, they brought up his limousine. And so they have these limos. And he jumps in the car first. I get his seat. He gets the jump seat. I thought, man, this is really cool. I am there with a president. Just And he kicked everybody else out of the car. Well, the driver was there. And, couple Secret Service guys up behind the windows. And so we're now driving down. He goes, General, we got two issues we got to talk about. I thought, uh-oh, what could I have done wrong? Well, so many things. <laughs> what could he have learned about? And he goes, General, they tell me you got too many bosses. And I thought, uh-oh, danger, Will Robinson. You know, <laughs> the president's my boss, the vice president, Secretary Rumsfeld, Ambassador Negroponte, Cambone, Chairman Mullen, at that time Pace, and the Commander Stratcom, Cartwright, who are you going to throw under the bus and live? <laughs> it was at that point that I realized that I love my bosses. I really do. <laughs> all of them are really good. And I said, Mr. President, they're all really good to me. And what I didn't realize and didn't think about, and he goes, well, General, if that's ever a problem, we'll fix it. I should have said, which one are you going to throw under the bus? I just want to know. I mean, it's just which ones, the, which, which are the ones on the cutting line here? Maybe we can negotiate. He goes, General, there's one other problem. And at that time, the terror surveillance program and some of those things were, were out and in the newspaper. He goes, General, this is going to get really bad. It's going to be real bad. Here's the deal. You defend the country, I'll take the heat. And he did, every step of the way. It was the greatest act of leadership that I had seen in 40 years. President Bush was vilified for doing some of the surveillance programs that he did as part of his constitutional authority to defend this country. And he took the heat, period. He went to NSA and he stood in a platform in the center with Vice President Cheney, McConnell, Hadley, and myself standing behind him, and he said he did this. I'm the president. It was the greatest act of leadership. I bring that up because we're now into a couple of areas. We have some great leaders in the military here, and for those of you who run other areas of cyber, it's the same thing. It's all about leadership. 
your people look up to you to make the decision and, to, and take responsibility and accountability for all that you do and don't pass it down. And I think as I look at that, that's what our nation needs. And in cyberspace, we have to have that approach. We have to have leadership. We need to make sure people are accountable. And you know, the, the nice part about having been in the military for 40 years, we have great leaders. Great leaders out there that will see us into the future. And we have great leaders in industry too. And for those of you who run cyber uh, teams, take responsibility and accountability. And then help push this forward. I think that's what's made us great. And that's what will make us great. And finally, just to wrap up, we are, I know I got two minutes and six seconds. No, I just said, he's watching. Get off the stage. No. Um, you know, I'll just wrap up with this, this kind of thought. We created the internet. We're the nation that created the internet. We have this innovation nation. We ought to be the first to secure it. And we can do this. Thank you very much, folks. Thanks. So we're going to take a couple of questions. So Make we don't have easy. a lot of time. So uh, if anyone has a question, we have people with uh, microphones. Right and people with, uh, please wait for the microphone to come up. Nope, we had recorded. So it's co coming up right here, maybe, right in front. Oh, yeah. Right there. They're, they're coming all, all around you here. Uh, sir, my name's Bethany Duff. Uh, worked under your command 2010 to 2013. Um, Thanks for your service. Thank you, sir. Uh, how do you think we could have better responded to Snowden? Great question. A military strike was always one of the thoughts I had. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Actually, I think the issue that we, we, we debated this uh, a lot, Chris Inglis, probably the best civilian I've ever worked with. He's amazing. Uh, please sit down. Um, he was the best. We, we talked about it. Do we go out and potentially put other programs at risk that are protecting the nation just to defend ourselves? And the answer was, you know, I, I actually had this conversation with him. You know, things were going great at NSA. We'd been there seven years, this is seven plus years, and, you know, we amazing time. And it's easy to lead when things are going great and everybody's doing great. Well, now we're going to earn our money. It's not going to be good, and we'll take the heat for it. And you may know we stood up in front of the NSA civilians and said that. Having said that, I think 2020 hindsight is the facts, while they were put out there, didn't get through the social media and the media itself. So those facts on the program, those facts that Jeffrey Stone made, are in the review group's publications. And they talk about, well, I'm not for this, I did this, we changed this, but they're out there. But the American people don't see those because they get a news clip. We didn't take the social media high road that we should have. And I think that's a lesson learned. You've got to do that. When you have something like that, you've got to go out and say, here's the facts. This program was approved by Congress, was approved by the courts, and approved by the administration, and all three oversaw it. And every time a mistake was made, we went to the courts and explained it. And they never, they found nothing in those review groups that NSA had done wrong. Nothing after all those months of investigation. That doesn't come out. It needs to. It absolutely needs to get out. And I think two parts, because one, you know, there's such a distrust of government, but those people in government, you know, a majority of those are military people, are just doing what our nation has asked them to do to defend this country. And a large portion of that, the folks at NSA, as you know, 6,000 had deployed to Afghanistan and Iraq. That's huge. They're not out here to spy on the American people. They're there to protect them with the rules and the regulations that they were given. That never comes out, and it needs to. And so, you know, if everybody in this room could just say it to two more people, in 30 days, it would be a lot of people. One, One more. more. Great question. Thank you. 
Do we got someone in the back here? Yep, way back. He's going to be first to lunch. <laughs> uh, General, thank you. Tim Rideup from the German Marshall Fund. Um, I'm trying to think forward into the future about sort of how we have conversations as technology revolutionizes our society. So when, you know, quantum computing and artificial intelligence come into their own, how do we avoid, you know, the Snowden type situation where we can sort of explain, okay, this, the, the, the dynamics have changed. You know, here's what you need to know. There's still some secrets we have to keep, but, you know, the technology has outpaced our understanding of the world. And I know that General uh, Hayden has spoken well to this. Yeah, so uh, that's a great question, and it follows along with the last one. And that I would start with we have to have a transparent debate on a number of issues. Senator Warner brought out the uh, encryption one. We should talk about that. What's it mean for it, and what's it mean against it, and where do we go? It ought not be something that's decided without all of us being in there. In fact, imagine a world where we all have a voting with identity management on our mobile device, and we get to read something, we get all the facts, and then you can vote between 1900 and 2000, and the nation's vote would be out there. Here's what we believe. Um, I think in, in this case, we have to get those facts, and we have to explain what it means, where we're going, and what we're going to do on it. As you go into the cyber arena, the thought of having two networks was very uh, good to think about seven, eight years ago. Now with convergence, we can't do that. So it gets to the point where incredible opportunities for medical, for driving. You know, my mother's getting at, hopefully she's not listening to this, but, you know, she's up to 90. I would really like to have her in a driverless vehicle. It would be much safer <laughs> for all of us. And... Uh, uh, sorry, Mom. And, and so when you think about it, there's tremendous opportunities here, right? And if we could explain it to the American people and give them the facts and they can see and not skew it to, imagine this, a driverless vehicle had an accident. The same day, over somebody uses a statistic, about 4,000 people were in wrecks and several thousand killed with driver cars. But that didn't come out. It was a driverless vehicle had an accident, or this, or this. And so when you look at that, you say, okay, is it better? Are we getting better? And the answer, we probably would be. And I think, so we ought to, we ought to go down that road. You know, you look at the iPads that can now, uh, these devices that can map our human genome for about 100 bucks, where it was thousands before. These are great advances, the medical community. So we've got to run down that road, and we've got to help the American people and our allies come up with a solution. And I'll just take one step, one moment to say our allies. You know, this is an area where our country can work with our allies and come up with a solution. We need to do that. What happens if a country is attacked in cyberspace? I know NATO's looking at it. We now need to get out in front and then say, how are we going to operate in cyberspace? And put that on the table. So some great opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much.